man. So fun. <laughs> Almost too fun. But I can handle it. Uh, well, thanks, guys. Uh, it's great to see you all. And uh, if this, yeah, if you've been coming a long time or if this is your first time, uh, welcome to Challenge. My name's David. And uh, yeah, as Daniel might have said in that, uh, you know, very impressive introduction. Yeah, I'm the director of Challenge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just excited to be here with you all. And so uh, let me get started. So um, what I want to start is like a thought that I have in my head and a question I guess I want to ask you is, do you know any people in your life who... If you get talking about food to them, they get kind of like pretentious about it, where if you say, oh, let's go to this barbecue place in town, right? They'll be like, that's not, that's not the real good barbecue place. In fact, you can't even get good barbecue around here, right? You might, you know, you had to go like to the South, right? To get the really good, the true barbecue, right? <laughs> Are any of you, that person, it's cool, like if we got, yeah. It's so, I, you know, I respect you, I just need you to respect me and not make me feel bad for liking like the lesser crud that you don't enjoy, it's, you know? Like, that's, that's what I want, okay? So, so there's that, you know, I picture, like, okay, has anybody ever hit you with the wasabi thing? <laughs> Brendan does. You know what I mean? They're all like, did you know that what you're eating is not actually wasabi and you had to like go to Japan or whatever to even taste real wasabi? I don't even know if that's, I didn't research that for this. I just have people in my life tell me that sort of thing. I'm always like, just let me like stuff, man. Like, you know, this is the only wasabi I'm like ever gonna know. So let me have this, you know? I don't know, that's kind of where I'm at with this. But uh, you, you know, I just want you to feel the freedom to to do you, but just, you know, that's kind of the, the thought that I'm thinking about here as I read something like this passage that's at the front, the, the, the tippy top of your handout here, John 6, 54 through 55, it says, Jesus says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food. And my blood's true drink. You know what that's all about? Okay, you know, I don't know. But imagine, you know, you're going out to like sushi with Jesus. And you're like, oh, it's wasabi, you know? It's pretty good. It's kind of spicy. And he's like, bro, I am the true wasabi. You can't get the real stuff anywhere but from me, you know? That's what he's, he's saying. My flesh is the true food, the true whatever food, wasabi, you name it. And, you know, he's not being pretentious about this, though, because, guys, he is uh, who he says he is. If we believe what the Bible says, that he is who he says he is, and he can be trusted when he says that he is the true food, there's a lot to unpack with these ideas. That's pretty weird. Um, and so I want to I want to go through that and unpack it with you uh, for the rest of our time together, evening together. So I want to share with you this. This is a big chapter, John chapter six. We're basically kind of going to go through this entire chapter, the narrative, which is I found really fascinating as I've been researching it for the past little while. And we see in here four responses to Jesus. Four responses to Jesus as the bread of life. He presents himself to the people around him, these different groups of people, as the bread of life. And we see them respond in different ways. And then he kind of dialogues back with them. And uh, some of them just can't take it, man. And so we're going to look into that. Now, the context here, the first part of the chapter, it, it starts with what some of us might consider a well-known miracle, of Jesus. He feeds 5,000 people. Have you heard of this before? The, pe the feeding of the 5,000. It's like a, a thing, <laughs> okay, in, in scripture. And, uh, and he miraculously, he takes a, a few loaves of bread and a few fish and he just multiplies them so that all these hungry people who are on this huge hillside, thousands of people can be fed. 
It's a miracle. Now, like the other miracles that Jesus performed, there was a deeper significance, right? A deeper meaning behind it. But his audience just often missed that entirely, right? And we'll get into some of the ways that people tend to miss that. And, uh, and then after that, so what happens is he feeds them all and everyone's like, woohoo, that's awesome. Like they're high on bread, you know, and they're like really stoked about that. And, uh, and he, he dips. The, the Bible says he dips, okay, basically. And he's out of there because uh, they want to make him king. They're like, this was so awesome. We ate so well today. We want you to like be in charge and lead us to basically overthrow the evil government which, you know, it was pretty bad. But uh, so he was like, I don't, that's not what I came here to do though. I didn't come here to overthrow this or that. I didn't come to do just impressive things that are going to amaze people and, and just give them some cool stuff and supply them with some bread. No, he, he is like, I got bigger fish to fry. And so he actually, he leaves He starts, uh, his disciples get in a boat and go across. They're like on a shore. They go through across the water and he actually starts walking to them. He does another miracle. He walks to his disciples who are in a boat. Um, He's just just on the water, just walking on the water. And then um, in, in, in some sense from the text, it seems like he's walking on the water to get away from all these people that are just like so stoked that he's giving them free bread, uh, free food, you know? And so he leaves them. And there's this huge crowd of people now that are like, oh shoot, where's bread guy? Like bread guy left, I guess, because the next, the next day, like he's gone, they're trying to look around for him and uh, they couldn't find him. And so the first problem, the first response that we see in this is of the crowd, this crowd of people, it's just, that's what the text calls them. Their, their problem, their response to Jesus was consumerism, the crowd and consumerism. And you can write, jot that down if you'd like. They were so interested in what Jesus could do for them. We'll expl- I'll explain that more here. It says, when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there anymore, right? They got into the boats. They went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. They're looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? They're like, we didn't, there's, they saw only so many boats. He didn't use a boat to leave. It's because he walked on water. He's like, they're looking for him, which is a good step. You know, they're, they're seeking Jesus, but, but something's missing. There's something that's wrong with their motives, their motives in seeking Jesus. Okay. And in verse 28 of this passage, they ask him, Like, what can we do to perform the works of God? Now, I'm not entirely sure what all that means or what they're getting at, but it seems kind of like like the works of God, like miracles, like the cool stuff that Jesus is doing to like multiply bread or just walk on water or other crazy things that he can do. But either way, they're trying to do these works of God. And they're they're like, hey, how can we get in on that? You know, that's what they're asking him. The crowd's looking for something from Jesus in some kind of practical sense. And he responds, Jesus' response is, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. This is the work of God. See, Jesus, he's trying to direct their focus away from the works and the miracles and what they can get, what they can take from him out of Jesus. And instead, he wants them to focus on believing in him. He wants them to focus on spiritual realities, not superficial trivialities. And so, but they, 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 they don't get it. Okay. They're not getting it. The next thing they say, what sign then are you going to do so that we can see and believe you? They said, like, what are you going to perform? He's, they, they continue, our ancestors, they ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. These guys, they're appealing to the Old Testament where God provided for his chosen people, the Israelites, by sending them 
special bread from heaven, miraculously. And he did this every day for years, it seems. And, and it was called manna. It says, hey, our answer is at the manna. God gave them manna. So like, they're, they're basically appealing to that. Hey, why can't you do that for us? You know, if you're really from God. And once again, Jesus is trying to get them on track about what's really at stake here. He responds, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Let me read that again. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Wow, that's a profound statement. So how does the crowd reply? They said, sir, give us this bread. In other words, translation, like, heck yeah, brother. Like, we, yeah, more bread. Okay, cool. Let's, let's hear it. You know, let's have it. Or they're like, you know, like bread, please. Okay, whatever. I'm ready for the bread now, Jesus. It's like, they're just missing the point. You know, he's trying to point them toward a spiritual reality and they're just not getting it. Uh, and so he responds to that. And he says, he's like, I haven't, I guess I haven't been clear enough. So he says this, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I'm the bread, it's me, okay? Jesus, see, Jesus can, and he often will meet your physical needs and desires, but he is so much more than that. So when we come to him looking for the ways that he can meet those needs above all the ways that he is sufficient for us to supply his grace and to meet our deep, deep spiritual needs, then we're missing the point. He came to embody the bread of eternal life, not just to give you the bread of temporary sustenance. He responded by attempting, he's trying to turn the crowd's attention toward eternal matters. He came to remedy our problem of sin, but all the crowd cared about was what was right in front of them. And that's, you know, that's a tragedy. They couldn't, they couldn't connect the dots. And we have the opportunity to read this passage and try and connect these dots and really figure out, man, what's he really getting at here? And he's going to go on. But before he does, or before I read on, Colossians 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So that's the charge that Colossians gives us in this letter to a church in the New Testament. And this is Jesus's charge to us. He's like, there's, there's bigger stuff at stake than your free food, okay, you know? And so that's what he's trying to point us to. And he's gonna continue to make that point. But this consumer mindset what can, he, what can Jesus offer me? Is, uh, that's a problem that we need to try to root out at its source. So the next group that Jesus is talking to, I'm just picking this from how it reads in the text. It talks about the crowds and the next group he start, it starts talking about is the group that it's just called the Jews. These different, these Jews and their problem with Jesus was criticism. Their response to him was criticism. You see, because in lots of places in the, in the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus' life, the Jews, or especially the Jewish leaders, they're kind of going toe-to-toe, -to -toe and they're kind of in conflict with Jesus because he's saying some new stuff, and it's kind of breaking their traditions, and they can't handle it. And honestly, they, think, they consider him a threat. He's a threat to their power. He's a threat to their their traditions. And so that's the thing that, uh, that he's having to deal with. And so he, their response to him a lot of the time in his, in his ministry on earth was criticism. 
And we see it right here. In verses 41 and 42, it says, Therefore the Jews started grumbling about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother, like, we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Now, this seems kind of reasonable. Like, picture, like, imagine if someone from your high school just got up and started telling people, I'm the bread of life. <laughs> You'd be like, no, you're not. You're Jeff, you know? <laughs> like, what the heck, man? You know, that's, that's kind of the... the posture that they have toward him in this. And while they have some good questions, they're confused sort of, because they're clearly not connecting the dots that God actually designed some key miraculous things to happen, the virgin birth. And honestly, there's all these miracles he's doing. He's on miracle number five by now. So there's some divinity. There's something special going on with this guy. He's not just Jeff. And, and so they're asking these questions though. And the nature of the, their questions implies that, like the crowd, the Jews had impure motives as they dialogued with Jesus. There's once again this problem of impure motives. Where's that question coming from? Is it to humbly seek the truth? Or is it just to make a point, make a show of you know, your intelligence to try to trick, trick Jesus or whatever? You know, what's, what's the basis of your questions that you're asking Jesus? They weren't trying to obtain the truth. They were just trying to prove a point. So Jesus continues, he responds by breaking down and restating some of the points he's already made. Jesus' response says, truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. That's pretty clear. Anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died, okay? This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He's starting to lean into his metaphor in an increasingly uncomfortable way, right? The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And the Jews, they pick up on this. They're like, and it says here, at that the Jews argued among themselves. They were grumbling earlier, now they're arguing. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Once again, kind of a good question, but where is it coming from? You know, like what's, what's the source of that thought, that question? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus has a choice in this moment. He's like, am I going to make this easier for them to handle and kind of dumb it down? Or am I, am I going to double down on the whole cannibalism concept? Uh, and I think you know the answer. His response, truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Whew. It's, it's kind of a lot. Now, for us, Jesus is not talking about literally eating him. Okay, just for anybody who's still, that'd be absurd, okay? But he is talking about a kind of total commitment to him that is radical. A commitment that invites him to come and take up residence within you. 
And he says, anyone who believes has eternal life. He says, I am the bread of life. This is not about bread, you guys. This is not about bread. This is about belief. What are you placing your belief in? And so he says, I'm, let me break this down a little bit further. He says, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, remains in me and I in him. And this is very reminiscent of what he says later in the book of John, in chapter 15, it says, this is Jesus talking. He says, he uses a more palatable metaphor. Remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. This remaining concept, also known as abiding, is seen here as well as in chapter six. And so as a branch, it's utterly dependent on the vine for nutrients, right? And life. So too, we are utterly dependent on Jesus to give us abundant life. To do this, we must abide or remain in him, which is, that's a personal, that is an intimate connection. Jesus transforms us from within. Jesus transforms us from within. And so that's where it needs to take place, which is why we need to kind of, in some sort of an uncomfortable, challenging way, receive him into our heart to, to fill us. He wants to fill us with his sustenance that is eternal, eternal life, the bread of life. Now, this idea of eating his flesh is also touched on during an event called the Lord's Supper. Who's heard of the Lord's Supper? And so this is an event where Jesus met with his disciples before he was to be crucified, the Last Supper, right? Um, or the Lord's Supper. And so in Matthew, it records this. As This is right before he was about to be crucified. He's meeting with the, the 12 disciples. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and he broke it. Note that and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. There's a lot here, once again, that's kind of difficult to deal with or understand, but this is an ordinance. This is a, a ritual that churches practice even today through what's called communion, right? And, and Christians, we get together in order to, in, in another place it says, in remembrance of me, Jesus says, in remembrance of me. There's a few different aspects of what communion really means, but in some sense it symbolizes our unity with Christ. We eat the bread and he, it's like that bread is now part of us. And while, once again, this is symbolic and not literal, this is a, a symbolic way of, expressing and committing our unity with Jesus as we take the bread and, and the cup. And then another component of, of what he's talking about in our, our main chapter tonight, as well as in the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, is that his flesh and blood are demonstrations of his love and his sacrifice and salvation. It says he broke the bread and said, all right, like, eat this. And he said, you know, drink the, the, the cup for this is my blood poured out, poured out. He's alluding to his coming sacrifice where he is going to die for the sins of the world, the world then 2000 years ago and the world now and the world for the rest of time. He's about to do that for us. And so when we take the bread and the cup, we do this, that in remembrance of him. And when we, choose to, when we choose to eat the bread of life, that is Jesus, we are acknowledging his body broken for us. That's what he does for us as, as the true food, as the true drink. There's a lot more that's confusing, that's difficult to understand. I realize that. But, and it can be healthy, okay, to ask good questions, right? I encourage you to ask good questions and to seek answers. But 
But criticism for criticism's sake, that's just, that's not gonna lead you anywhere. And, and we really need to check our hearts, check our motives to determine, am I, am I seeking this answer humbly or am I just trying to kind of get my opinion out there? Or am I trying to kind of trick some, something here or trick somebody? There's different false motives that we can have as we approach Jesus with bold claims like this one. And so continue to, to seek truth, but do so from a pure, a pure heart. And so that's the first two groups. The third group that the text draws our attention to is what I'm calling the many disciples, the many disciples. And they struggled with their response of skepticism. They responded with skepticism. Now this sounds to me at least similar to the previous one, criticism, right? But the difference is that skepticism, it comes from a place of sincere doubt or discouragement and uncertainty. And, and you, you can kind of be bewildered, right, in some way and um, taken aback. And, but this skepticism, unfortunately, just like the others, it leads us nowhere. And in verse 60 of the, the passage, it says this, Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, this crazy thing about, you know, eating my body, all this, these things, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? This teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Jesus' statements, they were hard. <laughs> They're right, okay? They were hard to, to understand, they're hard to accept. They're hard to commit to, right? They're hard to understand in the sense that it's confusing. He's this weird metaphor about, you know, being, you know, eating his body and all this stuff. This is confusing stuff. I understand that. And they're, they're just, well, that's too hard. And then also it's hard to accept. This is truth that's hard to accept because even in the following verse, Jesus says, like, does this offend you? <laughs> he asks them that. Does this offend you what I'm telling you, what I'm saying? Um, cause yeah, it probably was in some way it's offensive in the sense that it's kind of a grotesque, almost subject matter, right. To even like be talking about, um, but two, it's offensive in the sense that it implies that we're in need of a savior to, to fill us and we're not sufficient on our own. And that's like a truth that we need to grapple with, with Jesus as we, as we struggle to not take offense to his statement about our condition. And then two, and then third, it's hard to commit to. It's hard to understand, it's hard to accept, and it's hard to commit to in that it is costly. The cost of discipleship is great. The cost of following Jesus is great. But the spirit actually, the spirit that Jesus gives us helps us to overcome the difficulty of the message. He basically spells this out. He responds to them saying, the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. He's saying, man, cling to what I'm telling you. You might not get it at all. You, might, you don't need to get it all, but the spirit helps you. And the flesh doesn't help at all. The spirit's the one who gives life. He gives discernment and wisdom and many other things. And uh, the words that I've spoken to you though are our spirit and our life. In a book called Faith Wins, the, uh, professor, he's a professor, a writer, and a speaker named Adam Groza says that casual disciples, casual disciples, the many, right? They want the bread and the wine but not the body and the blood. There is a commitment, a dedication that comes from truly following Jesus as a true disciple. If we are true disciples and not just casual ones, we need to fight doubt with faith. And we need to fight uncertainty with trust. This, this, this guy who actually wrote this, he's going to be coming to challenge in about a month to speak to us. And so we have a lot to look forward to there, but uh, just thought I'd sprinkle that in for you. Um, so um, Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
And do not lean on your own understanding, but rather in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. He will make your paths straight. But you got to trust in him and don't lean on your understanding because it's limited. We have a limited perspective. We're down here. There's only so much we can understand of the symbols and the things that God wants to reveal to us, but he can help. And then their response after that, verse 66, from that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied them. No longer accompanied him. And so we're forced to reckon with them. Like, am I, am I in this for the long haul? Am I... I'm at a crossroads just like these many disciples, these casual disciples sometimes. And I need to decide, am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to turn back and no longer accompany him? This is a choice to make. And, and Jesus, he's not over here going, please, please stay, you know. He's not begging them. He says the next verse, he said to the 12, the 12 disciples, he had like thousands of people with him earlier, okay, from what the text tells us. He said to the 12, he's got 12 dudes in front of him now. He said to the 12, you don't want to go away too, do you? As if to say, like, there's the door. <laughs> like, now's your chance, really. He's almost inviting them, like, it is, you get to choose. You get to choose. We all get to choose if we're really going to follow him. And, and, and choose to believe in him through eating the flesh and drinking the blood. And so he asks them, you don't want to, do you want to go away too? But number four, the 12 respond with belief. Belief. Not an ism, not some sort of ideology, but just belief. They didn't see Jesus as a means to an end. They didn't see him as a threat, right? They didn't see him as a lunatic or a, or a burden that was too, too hard. They saw him for who, they saw Jesus for who he is. Verses 68 and 69, Simon Peter, he answers on behalf of the 12. He says, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. They're convinced. Jesus can turn your believing into knowing if you will stick with him. In this life, you may not get every desire satisfied. You may not get every question answered and you may not get every doubt resolved. But if, if you'd simply believe, he will take care of the rest and sustain you into eternity where every desire is satisfied and every question is answered and every doubt is resolved. Reject, reject a consumer mindset by embracing Jesus as Lord, as Lord and not just as a supplier. And reject criticism by abiding in him humbly and coming under his submission or submitting yourself to him. And reject skepticism by trusting God completely, even when it is hard. He is the true food. Psalm 34 says, taste and see, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for making yourself available to us, for shedding your blood for us, for making your flesh and your blood available for us to, to experience new life, 
and to, and to experience the living bread, the bread of life that never, never doesn't satisfy us, Lord. And so I pray that we would just commit ourselves to you. I pray that we would make the choice. Every person in this room will make the choice truly tonight to follow you wholeheartedly and to believe in what you are telling them. Against all challenges, against all odds, God, I commit myself to you. Everybody in this room we, who, who chooses to follow you and be a true disciple, we commit ourselves to you, God. And I pray that you would lead us from here to continue to believe and not waver and, and let your spirit guide us on that, on that way so that we can truly experience you um, in the next life. In Jesus' name, amen.